Amen. Thank you. Can you thank them for leading us in worship? <clears throat> All right. Well, we have been going through the book of Nehemiah. Has anyone enjoyed that? Yeah. All right. Good, good. I have. I, I certainly have. It's been a lot of fun. So uh, personally, it's been good for me. It's been um, beneficial to me on several different fronts. It's really caused me to think through some pastoral leadership stuff and then uh, really um, be able to s- kind of set the tone for things that I feel like God is calling us to do as a church family. And so I've been very grateful for the opportunity to walk through this series together with you. Um, last week, we looked at chapters 4 and 6. We were looking at opposition to the work of God. And we were recognizing that chapters 4 and 6 both deal with kind of these external threats to the work and, and uh, f- you know, people who are physically, who are, who are claiming that they're going to come and physically oppose the work itself. And there are all these difficulties. And so we looked at that, but we passed over chapter 5. And really, all three of those chapters kind of go together. They all deal with opposition. But chapter 5 deals with this, uh, really in my mind, a more difficult kind of opposition, which is internal, the internal threats of coming unraveled from the inside. And so we're going to pick that up this week, and, and uh, we're going to notice how God is at work even in the midst of that. So let me pray, and uh, then we'll get to work. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask right now for a blessing on our time together in your word. We pray for your Spirit's ministry to us. Lord, we're grateful that you're a speaking God. And that you desire for us to hear your voice this morning. And so we want to we wanna lean into that this morning. We want to claim that this morning, that you are going to speak to us by your word. And we feel very dependent and needy on you. And so we ask, Lord, for your Spirit's help in these moments. Would you, God, speak to us and help us to know as a community of faith and as individual believers how to walk faithfully with you. We pray this, please, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you have a Bible, go ahead and get with me to Nehemiah chapter 5. You can do that on your phone. We also have um, copies of the Bibles in the baskets under the chairs. And so if you grab one of those out, it would be on page 386. And we're going to kind of walk through this story, uh, which falls into three different scenes. It's telling the tale of Nehemiah dealing with this internal threat. And it happens in three different sections. Initially, there's a problem, and the problem is unearthed. It's revealed. And so we see that in the first um, five or six verses. And then there's a solution in verse 6 to 13. There's a solution and really a bunch of solutions that Nehemiah kind of outlines for the people and how to move forward. And finally, we we catch this glimpse of what it's going to look like moving forward. And Nehemiah kind of shares his personal strategy for how to maintain this way of integrity. So, so let's go ahead and get to work. First off, there's an outcry. The problem starts with the people making it known that things are not the way that they're supposed to be. Verse 1, now the men and their wives raised a great outcry against their fellow Jews. The men and their wives raised a great outcry against their fellow uh, kinsmen. They, they were telling him, they were about to tell Nehemiah and the leadership, this is, there's something going on here and it is not okay and it is threaten, threatening us. And so this, this great outcry arises, and, and I notice right away that it, it highlights the wives. And personally, I know that's been true, where Ash, over multiple times in our, in our life together, she has kind of been the one who says, hey, by the way, have you thought about this? And that's such a gift of God, because honestly, I don't know if you're like me, but I think God made men often uh, like this, where we kind of put our work boots on, and we get our heads down, and we're monotask, and so we're doing something, and we're just like going after it. And our wives are the ones who are like paying attention to everything. They're paying attention. They're going, hey, have you thought about this? Have you thought about how this affects us in this, in this area? And so it's a, it's a gift of God when, when um, our wives are able to say, hey, check this out. Pay attention to this. And, and so that's what's going on here with these people. They have this issue and the men and their wives are raising this great outcry. There's a, there's a problem within the community itself, and people are in desperate need. Now, it shows up in, in four different ways. First off, there are people who, who need to get resources in order to maintain their way of life. Look at verse 2. Some were saying, we and our sons and daughters are numerous. In order for us to eat and stay alive, we must get grain. There's this building project going on where Nehemiah and, and, and the guys, they're building this wall around the city in order to reestablish themselves there. Uh, but there's people now who are beginning to, to say, hey, 
we are in a desperate condition. We do not have the resources available to us in order to, to eat and stay alive. And so some were raising that up, saying there's lots of us. We have sons and daughters. We're numerous, and we need grain in order to survive. Uh, another thing comes forward in verse 3. Others were saying, we are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our homes to get grain during the famine. There's such a desperate need within the community itself uh, that people are having to mortgage out what they, what they own in order to have resources, in order to continue forward. So the problem is pretty severe. And we see here in verse 3 that it's, that it's really amplified by the fact that there's a famine going on as well. And so these problems probably stretch way further back, even before Nehemiah showed up on the scene. But now they're coming to a head as everybody has been dedicated to the workforce. So all of the people are kind of passionately involved in this work. But meanwhile, there are families that are suffering. And so there's this, this thing going on that's this internal threat that if it's not tended to, it could unravel, it could threaten the entire project itself. Another group, verse 4, still others were saying, we have had to borrow money to pay the king's tax on our fields and our vineyards. They're, they're in such a desperate condition that they're having to, to borrow money just to pay the bills. And so this is, all, this is a problem, but, but we notice that it is against, look back up to verse 1, it is all an internal problem within the community itself. It's an outcry against their fellow Jews. Everyone is feeling the effects of this working project and this famine, and, and there's specific people who are in a desperate condition. Look at verse 5. Although we are of the same flesh and blood as our fellow Jews, and though our children are, are as good as theirs, yet we have had to subject our sons and daughters to slavery. Some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but we are powerless because our fields and our vineyards belong to others. It's saying that there, there's this problem within the community itself where the, the people who have resources are, are borrowing and lending money to those who do not, but it's getting to the point now where they have nothing left. They have no further recourse. They have no further action that they can do other than to enlist their own children into the, into the labor force. To buy, and I know it says slavery, but it's much different than we would think of. It's basically saying, I'm going to give you my child. I'm going to enlist my child into your workforce on contract because I have nothing else. We have no more resources available to us. And if we don't do something, we will starve to death. And so the problem obviously is an economic problem. And there is a difference within the community itself of those who have and those who do not have. And so what I want to do as we work our way through this story is I want to kind of draw three lines of application. I want to draw three different specific things that will connect both to what's happening for Nehemiah and those people, but to us as well. And they are the internal threat of relation. There's an internal threat that shows up relationally. There's an internal threat that shows up socially. And there's an internal threat that shows up financially. Relationally, and all these overlap a little bit, but relationally, we could say it like this. As they're working on this project and building this wall, who really cares if they're able to complete it and they're able to reestablish themselves if inside the city, nobody wants to live together? Right? If there's a discrepancy in the community of faith, if there's complaints and outcries against fellow Jews, who cares if they're able to get their city going again if nobody wants to live in it? Relationally, we have to pay attention. Nehemiah is going to address this issue head on because he recognizes this is a serious threat to the people of God. And we too, we want to pay attention to this. Who really cares if we have a campus down here and we're holding services every week? And who really cares if a bunch of people are showing up and financially we're doing well? Who really cares if this is a toxic environment to be in? Now, I'm saying that in, in a pretty severe way because I want, to, I want to make sure that we're always on top of this one, that we're paying attention to how we relate to one another, that we make sure that the relationships within our community are healthy. Um, it, it's a key feature. We've been talking about it all along. We want this to be a gospel culture, an environment, an atmosphere where you can come in here and you can be loved and accepted as you are, but you're loved far too much to be left there. That it's a place where you can be vulnerable and real and authentic and transparent even, and you're still loved, but there's a, there's, there's a work of God, a growing in grace that we're all experiencing together. And so we need to pay attention relationally because if the relationships in here on ministry teams, between leaders, between individuals, if it gets toxic, it's a place that nobody wants to hang out at. I was reading this week, and I don't remember where I saw it, but 
um, the leading cause of missionaries leaving the field is interpersonal conflict. So you, we've got all these missionaries that we send overseas cross-culturally to proclaim the news of Christ, but the unfortunate part is many of them that leave the field are doing so because the relationships have not been paid attention to, and it becomes toxic, and they can't stand one another, and they go home. And I don't want that to be true of our church, and we know that can be true of churches. That churches, though we have the greatest news ever, the environment and the culture that we create with our relationships betrays that news. It, it says something different. It says, yes, we believe in a God who accepts people, who loves people, who draws people to himself, and then our culture actually communicates something very different. And so I want to pay attention to that and make sure that doesn't become true of us as a campus. We want to pay attention to our relationships. Secondly, we notice here that this problem, this internal threat, brings forward the reality that there are different social groups. There are the officials and the nobles. There are those who have maybe been around for a lengthier period of time that have resources and those who do not. And that difference, those distinctions, actually become more and more pronounced here in this story. And so we want to be careful that we don't allow that to happen here as well. That we don't allow the differences within our community to become dividing walls between us. Uh, we want to make sure that we press into that reality that in Christ we are one. And there could be wealthy people in our congregation and people who are financially pretty hard off, but we are one in Christ and we care for each other. Um, we we want to make sure that there aren't differences in, you know, let, let's even say ge geographical differences where we say, well, those are Rockton Rossigo people and these are McChesney Park people. Okay, we have to be careful of the different labels that we use because in Christ we are one. And one that came to the surface after last week was we want to be careful about the difference between those who have been a part of this from day one and those who are stepping into it now five to six months into it. Those, that are, those of us that have had a friendship or a relationship that even predates the launch of our church. Um, last week we had a first-time visitor and she came on the recommendation of a member of our Beloit campus. And so she came to check things out. And... Um, after the service, she emailed her friend from the Beloit campus, and this was passed along to me, but, but she said the service was great, the music, the teaching, all those different components. She was warmly welcomed as she came in, but she said, nobody talked to me. And so I didn't like, bring this up to our guest services team because I know they're doing, they're doing what we've asked them to do, greeting people as they come in and, and uh, you know, mingling before, during, and after services. But this is kind of a community issue where we kind of gravitate to the people that we know and we spend time with one another and we can neglect those who are new that are coming in. And I want to, as a church family, say that's not okay. We're going to do our best job that we can to pay attention. And when new people are here, we're going to try to be welcoming and, and create an environment where they can get to know others as well. We want to be careful of these different social distinctions that can be made. And we want to make sure that people have the opportunity to come together in this community of faith. Here's the third thing that we see. This one's closer to the surface of the text. It's that financial issue. Obviously, in the story, you've got people who are desperately in need financially. They're mortgaging their stuff. They're having their kids go to work. They're doing all these different things, and it's still not enough. They're borrowing money to pay their taxes. And, and basically, the story is telling us that we have an obligation to care for one another. That just as they did in Nehemiah's day, we do as well. That as the community of faith, we have an obligation to look after one another. Uh, physically, uh, but also financially. And so we should be willing then to care for one another. And uh, look for opportunities then to bless one another. And I'm going to suggest a few different things a little bit later on, but, but today as we take a love offering, it's an opportunity for us to uh, be, kind of be thrown a softball. Like this is an opportunity for us to say, if we care about the poor, here's a way that we can do something about it. Here's a few different ministries that as a church family, we endorse and support. Uh, but I think that it can be even better than that. I think that we can care for one another in a very real and tangible way. So those three things, the relationships, the social dynamics and the financial picture, all of that, I think we're going to follow that along through this story. So here's my question. Do they have to stop the work? Is the project going to stall out? Is this internal threat going to cause the project to come to a screeching halt? And the answer is no. Nehemiah responds with a solution. 
And, and I'm reminded of in the book of Acts when the church was also faced with an internal threat. There were widows and some of the widows were being overlooked in the distribution of food. And they had to make a decision real quick. What are we going to do? The Bible itself says that true religion is caring for widows. We can't just neglect this one. We can't shelve this one. So what are we going to do? And what they decide to do is to designate individuals to care for that ministry. And they move forward with the ministry of word and prayer. And I just kind of feel that as I read this story. Nehemiah recognizes we have to be able to multitask. We have to be able to deal with an internal threat on the fly and keep pressing forward. We have to be able to take just a moment to kind of reflect on it and say, what's the best course of action here? But at the same time, we have to keep looking ahead to what God is calling us to be and do. And so what does he do? He responds. Look at verses 6 and 7. When I heard their outcry and these charges, I was very angry. I pondered them in my mind. He emotionally connects with the fact that the people are being mistreated. He emotionally connects with the fact that they are in a desperate condition, and he's angry. He's angry with how the community has responded to this. He's angry with the fact that fellow Jews are, are doing all these different things to their kinsmen. He's angry, and then he reflects on it. And he maintains that anger, and he engages in a leadership endeavor here, but he does it without sinning which is pretty incredible because you know most of us when we get angry, the first thing we do is sin. I'm angry and then I just leash, you know, lash out and, and do something dumb. But this is Nehemiah exhibiting a Christ-likeness who's able to recognize something that is not right in God's world, to be, to be angry about it, to be physically upset over it, but to, but to have this posture, to, to have his poise about him, to be able to engage in it in a productive way, much like Christ did when he saw the money changers in the temple. What does he do? He fashions a whip. And I just imagine him just kind of sitting there very, you know, calmly fashioning a whip together, gets it ready. He's angry. He goes in there and he drives people away. There's a way to be angry and not sin. And that's what Nehemiah does here. He reflects on the situation. And then verse seven, he accuses the nobles and the officials. And I told them, you are charging your own people interest. He's, he's beginning to recognize that this internal threat has to be dealt with swiftly. And so he begins to kind of press them on this. And he calls together a meeting. So I called together a large meeting to deal with them. And he reveals how ironic it is what they have done. As far as possible, look at this verse 8. As far as possible, we have brought back our fellow Jews who were sold to the Gentiles. And now you're selling your own people only for them to be sold back to us. They kept quiet because they could find nothing to say. He's saying, this is silly that we have done everything that we can to get back into Jerusalem, to, to liberate people from the condition that they were in previously. And now, here's how ironic it is, they're being enslaved again. And this time, it's not to some foreign powers, it's to us. We are mistreating our own people. This is not how it should be. So I continued, verse 9, what you are doing is not right. Shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God? to avoid the reproach of our Gentile enemies. He's saying, what you are doing is not right. And, th and then he's recognizing, here, here's what we need to do then. There's three things that I love about this text. It brings forward the importance of ethics. Ethics is how you live your life. And he said, shouldn't you, shouldn't, should not you walk in the fear of our God? Okay? He's saying, th that's a phrase that really is an Old Testament way of saying, you ought to be living ethically, walking in the fear of the Lord. He's saying this is a very important thing for the people of God. You have to walk according, you have to live your life according to what God has revealed. And the fear of the Lord would be walking according to God's desires and his design. And that's what we need to do. We need to be people who care about ethics, and in my experience, both doing youth ministry and, and traveling around, and, um, I just recognize that I think this is something that often Christians kind of fall down on. We do not do this as well as we should. We ought to be connecting the gospel to everyday ordinary life, figuring out how to live in a way that is, that is ethically beautiful, reflecting the beauty of our God and his standards and his designs for us. And uh, tr truthfully, many Christians are just, they're, they're aware enough about this to kind of be dangerous. But we need to be people who this becomes the order of agenda where we want to walk in the fear of the Lord. And so I hope that as a campus, this can be something that we continue to press in on. How does our faith in God connect to our ordinary, everyday lives so that the, the way that we're living begins to reflect the nature of our God? 
in the New Testament is put this way, walk in a manner worthy of the gospel. And we need to figure out what that looks like in all of our different scenarios that we're in. How can we pursue ethics? So verse 9 ties together ethics with a love for neighbor. Now that's implied. It's saying you should have done this. And if you were walking according to God and his fear of him, then it would have showed up in how you relate to people that you're around. And so it's connecting ethics and love for our neighbor. If you love God, you're going to love people. If you fear God, he's going to show you how you ought to relate to one another. And so we need that. We need to think through, is my fear of God translating into how I interact with coworkers? Is my fear of God translating into how, do, how I parent? Is my fear of God translating into how I interact with people in, in the ordinary spheres of life? And so he connects these things together. Ethics, love for neighbor, and then witness. Uh, missions, ethics, and, and love for people ties together with missions. He said to avoid the reproach of our Gentile enemies. We want people to look at the quality of our lives, the way that we live, and we want them to get a sense of the beauty of the gospel. And too often, the way that we're living is actually miscommunicating the beauty of a relationship with God. And he's saying we ought to have been doing this so that we could avoid the reproach of the Gentiles. We need to live in a way that reflects the beauty of the gospel, and that itself will commend the message that we have. And then when we share it, it'll be more credible. So he says we need to walk in the fear of, of God. And then he says in verse 10 that he himself is also guilty. Look at this, verse 10. And my brothers and my men are also lending the people money and grain. So he doesn't excuse himself. He doesn't, you know, he's not taking the higher position and going, yeah, you guys are really screwing this up. I'm putting you on blast. But me and my crew, we're good at this. We're just loving people and, you know, we're caring for them and we're lending. No, he says, look, and I've done this too. And this get, gives him even greater credibility with the people because he's able to identify his own fault in it. And so he, he's confessing his own sinfulness in this. But then he says, but let's stop charging interest. And then here's the plan, verse 11. Give back to them immediately their fields, vineyards, olive groves, and houses, and also the interest you charge them. 1% of the money, grain, new wine, and olive oil. He says, let's have an immediate Jubilee. And Jubilee is that Old Testament time where things would be reset. Those who had borrowed would all of a sudden be freed from their debt. The season of life where everything kind of gets restored. And, and uh, Chris Wright says Christians are people who need to live in a constant state of Jubilee. We're people who need to live in this, this reality of being in relationship with God and sharing our possessions and just freely giving things away and recognizing that it is like they had in the Old Testament, a party. Um, when the jubilee would happen. But Nehemiah is saying, let's do this. Let's make this happen right now. Let's not postpone the solution to this problem. Let's bring it about even today. Give them back immediately all of these different things and return the interest that you've charged on it. And they agreed. Look at verse 12. We will give it back, they said, and we will not demand anything more from them. We will do as you say. In other words, they recognize this is God calling them now to this. They're about to return all of these different things. And Nehemiah is leading the way, both recognizing his own guilt in the scenario, but also being willing to lead by example. So then they make an oath, verses 12 and 13. I summoned the priests and made the nobles and the officials take an oath to do what they had promised. I also shook out the folds of my robe and said, in this way, may God shake out of their house and possessions, anyone who does not keep this promise. So may such a person be shaken out and emptied. At this, the whole assembly said, Amen, and praise the Lord. And the people did as they had promised. <clears throat> so he's recognizing that this threat is legitimate and he's taking action immediately. He's saying, we have to do something about this. We, we cannot allow this to kind of be shelved until we're done with the building project. It's something that we need to address right now so we can continue moving forward. And, uh, and, and by the grace of God, the people hear the challenge. They hear the rebuke. They see their leader admitting his own fault, and they're willing then to follow him forward in this. They take up an oath, and they say, we're going to do this. We're going we're to restore uh, to our brothers what rightfully belongs to them. And so that's what they do. That's the solution there. And then finally, we get this way forward. We get this final thought on how this affected Nehemiah and what it's going to do for him for the rest of his ministry there. And this really is a, 
uh, kind of a commentary on all this happened. So as we're looking at the story, it's kind of unfolding and we're progressing through a storyline. But here, once we get to verses 14 and following, it's him reflecting after all of it has already happened. He's kind of commenting back on, and this is what I decided to do as a result of it. You see that in verse 14 where he says, moreover, moreover, he's going to explain. We did this, we, we instituted a policy, we gave land back, but moreover, here's what I was willing to do for the rest of my time there. Look at verse 14. From the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, until his 32nd year, 12 years, neither I nor, nor my brothers ate the food allotted to the governor. So here we find out for the very first time that he not only went back to Jerusalem to rebuild the wall, but he actually became the governor of that area. He was the governor there for 12 years. And so he's saying what happened there in those early stages where there was an internal threat and he had to deal with it affected the remainder of his time with those people. He, he for those 12 years, he didn't take what was rightfully his, the food allotted to the governor. He, he forfeited that benefit that he would have as the leader. He was willing then to kind of fund his own project. He didn't want to put a burden on the people, so he forfeited the right to the food allotted to the governor. It reminds me of the Apostle Paul. Over and over in his ministry, Paul highlights the fact that he was going to pay his own bills. That though he had a right and a claim to being compensated for the ministry that he was doing, he said, I'm finding a way to be self-supported because I want people to recognize the grace of God most clearly in my ministry. And, and so Nehemiah is doing the same thing. Though he's the governor, though he could get a fat paycheck for what he's doing, though his work is significant and, and is desire, you know, deserving of being rewarded, he's saying, I didn't do that because I didn't want to be a burden to these people. And then he compares himself to earlier governors. Look at verse 15. But the earlier governors, those preceding me, placed a heavy burden on the people, and took 40 shekels of silver from them in addition to food and wine. Their assistants also lorded it over the people. So his leadership is very different than anything they've experienced before. Many leaders will place a heavy burden on the people, but Nehemiah is saying, I love these people and I care for them and I don't want to do that. In fact, here's the reason why at the end of verse 15, out of reverence for God, I did not act like that. Because he was relating to God, because he was fearing God, out of reverence for God, he said, I didn't do that. Though it was my right, though it was my claim as the leader, I did not place a heavy burden on these people. Look at verse 16. Instead, I devoted myself to the work on this wall. All my men were assembled there for the work. We did not acquire any land. He made this commitment to care for the people in a very specific way. He was willing to shoulder the financial burdens. Look at verses 17 and 18. Furthermore, 150 Jews and officials ate at my table as well as those who came to us from surrounding nations. Each day, one ox, six choice sheep, and some poultry were prepared for me. And every 10 days, an abundant supply of wine of all kinds. And so he was willing to resource and feed this enormous group of people on a regular basis. He, as the leader, was willing to care for his people. He wasn't saying, I'm going to get rich off the backs of these individuals. He's saying, as the leader, I'm going to lead the way in caring for people. And again, it's out of this fear of the Lord and love for the people. Verse 18, in spite of all of this, I never demanded the food allotted to the governor because the demands were heavy on these people. And finally, he asks for a prayer of blessing. Remember me with favor, Lord. Remember me with favor, my God, for all that I have done for these people. So Nehemiah recognizes this internal threat that the people are in conflict with one another. He comes up with a solution. We need to return the land, the money, the interest to these people so that we can move forward together. And then he says, and that's going to be the policy from here on out. I love these people. I fear the Lord. I want us to be able to go together into the future. And I'm not willing to place this heavy burden on them. So let's remind ourselves again of these different applications. Relationally, it's very important that we would pay attention to how we interact with each other because we cannot afford to have a toxic environment within the community of faith. We can't afford to have people who are kind of fighting with one another and speaking poorly about one another or feeling mistreated by one another. We have to do what we can to come together on these different things, to have brave and open and honest communication and to make sure that we're tracking together in the same direction. 
We need to be careful that we don't allow the social differences between us to become these things that are amplified, that cause division. We need to figure out how in Christ we can be one, regardless of our social standing, regardless of uh, how we would label ourselves or how we would think about ourselves. But as a community of faith, all of us need to come together and make sure that we're going into the future together. And finally, financially, uh, financially, we have to pay attention to this. And this really does get me excited, but it's also one of those categories in the Christian life that as a pastor, I'm like, I really don't know how to lead this thing out. Now, I've got some different ideas, and I think that it's pretty, pretty awesome to think through. What would it look like if the people of God, if the community of faith, really took this way of life seriously? So that we didn't just interact as individuals who think, well, this is, this is all my stuff. But we would, we would behave as the church in the first century behaved. So if anyone has a need, we would figure out together how we can meet that need. And as I read the New Testament, as I read that, those different examples, it didn't seem like there were these big policies or these big, you know, like, oh, it's got to run through all of the levels of leadership before we can do something. It just seemed very organic and natural that people would find out about a need and then that need would be met by other people who know and love them. And so as I think about the community of faith, as I think about you guys, as I think about us, I think, how could we live this thing out to where we are actually caring for one another to the point that we are helping one another out financially? Like, what would it look like if we considered our stuff to be given by God and to be used by the community of faith? And so when medical bills come up and we go, man, how are we going to pay for that? Then together we kind of rally and we go, well, let's figure this thing out together. Let's do what we can. Let's gift things to one another uh, because that's what we do. That's what we do. And I guess I think about it in terms of small groups. I think if we're in small groups together and we know and love one another and needs come up and we say, hey, let's meet this thing together. Let's care for one another. And we don't need policies and plans to be able to do this. We're just going to do it. We're just going to really legitimately care for each other. Now, we're squirming. I see a lot of squirming, which basically means oh, we don't like this idea. And I get that. But I think that when the gospel gets to that level in our hearts and we just say, everything that I have, it's actually God's. And I'm just going to use it in a way that I feel like would bless him and honor him and be helpful for his people. We've got a car. I can loan that out to people who need a ride. We've got stuff. Well, let's, let's just use it for God's glory in the community of faith. And I think that that's uh, something that this text calls us to do. Okay, so how do we do this? In closing, how do we do this? How do we actually grow in our ability to care for one another like this? And I'm going to suggest it's here in the story. It's in verses 9 and 15. It's this idea of walking in the fear of the Lord. It's this idea of being in a right relationship with God and growing in that and figuring out day by day what that looks like. And as we do that, as we walk in the fear of the Lord, it's going to show up in how we relate to one another. Uh, the way that we love and fear the Lord will actually translate into the way that we care for other individuals. Nehemiah, he, when he scolds the people, he uses that as the standard. You should have feared the Lord. That's what we need to do. Fear the Lord. Figure out what it looks like to walk in the fear of the Lord. And then when he commends himself later on in verse 15, he says, I didn't, I didn't tax the people. I didn't burden the people. I cared for them because of my reverence for God. So what do we need to do to grow in our fear of the Lord? How can we grow in walking in the fear of the Lord? And I think what we need to do then is consistently go before God and ask him, God, what do you want for me? What does it look like for me to fear you? What does it look like for my life to be marked by a walking, by an obedience? And um, I guess as I look at the story, I notice that there's kind of a gospel dynamic here. It's not something that we can go away from and go, you know what, guys, we're, we're just going to try this. We're going to work really hard at it. And we're going to fear the Lord and we're just going to be really great at caring for one another. Now, the gospel dynamic is where we go, this is well beyond any of us. This is like incredible stuff. This is supernatural stuff. We're going to need God. And we fail at doing this. Nehemiah goes, actually, guys, I'm also guilty. I lent money out as well. We have to recognize that we cannot do this on our own. We're not going to say, let's go try this and put on our work boots and then we just kind of go and do it. That's all self-righteousness. We're going to depend on the Lord to give us what, what the New Testament calls obedience of faith. It's walking in the fear of the Lord based on our faith in what God is doing in and through us. 
It's obedience of faith. We're going to walk in the fear of the Lord. We're going to figure out how to live our lives with that beautiful ethic, but we're going to do the entire project dependent upon the grace of God to give us what we need to be able to pull it off. We're not going to do it in our own strength because that would be ugly and deformed anyways. We will become self-righteous and condescending toward others. We're going to do it in the grace of God. There's a gospel dynamic at play here. We're going to walk in the fear of the Lord with obedience of faith, trusting at every step that the Spirit of God in us is going to help us to do what we need to do. And that can create a community that can handle internal opposition. It can handle external opposition. It can handle anything if we continue to press into that grace of God given us at the cross of Jesus Christ. So I'm going to pray. I'm going to invite the band to come back up. And I'm going to pray over us right now. And if you want more prayer, we've got our team ready and available at the back. But let's go ahead and go before the throne of God's grace. Lord, help us to walk in fear of you. Help us, Lord, to become people whose very lives reflect the beauty of the gospel message. Help us, God, to trust in what you've done for us that we can't pull it off on our own, but you have given us everything that we need for life and godliness. Help us, Lord, to have faith in your Son and the work that he has accomplished both at the cross and is accomplishing in us by his Spirit. And Lord, let us become a community of faith that does have this solidarity, that does have this close-knit relationship one to another, and that sincerely cares for each other. And not just with lip service, but to the degree that we actually do things for one another. And we use our resources for the good of the community. And that is all well beyond any of us, certainly beyond me. And so we need your help. Holy Spirit, would you help us to live this thing out in Jesus' name? Amen.